keys are to the glory days at the stick. From who's got it better than us to brick by brick. It's always the 49ers way from off season to game day. Yeah, we talk back. It's the 49ers cut back. It's 49ers Cutback Podcast time. We got a special one for you again today because we're going to be breaking down three players and there's a lot of juiciness to these players because 49ers have to decide how these guys are going to impact 2021. We're going to show how they impact the 49ers already and then you guys can make the decision whether they should be a part of the roster in 2021 or not. Horse, what are you thinking about this? I, I think one of these guys is awfully controversial with the fan base, yeah. and I'm really curious to see people's opinions on that one. But we'll keep who that is till it's, it's time to go. But um, I'm curious about that one. The other two, um, I'm also curious to see what the fans have to say after we, we break down some film for them and show them some, of their, some more of their positives. Absolutely. It's a big episode, but before we get into any of that, make sure you subscribe and like right now. Like the video, subscribe to the channel, hit that notification bell. That way you get notified at any time we do anything like this or any of the new stuff we got coming up in the future. Right. You don't want to miss it. And now that you've done that and taken the time, we really appreciate it. We can get on with the rest of the show and the rest of the podcast. No, exactly. seriously, pause, like, and subscribe. Oh, okay, okay. We're, we're not joking. It's, 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 it's serious. Because that way you can get into this juicy goodness right here. We got Brandon Ayuk, D Ford, and Kevin Givens on the table today. Mm -hmm. I'm excited about this episode. Me too. I'm assuming which, you can guess which one is the controversial guy. I mean, it's, it's probably Brandon Ayuk, absolutely. We're going to start with Brandon Ayuk. <laughs> the, the, D it's probably D Ford. But Brandon Ayuk, the, the breakout star on the 49ers offense this year for the rookie, for, for our rookie class. Again, the second wide receiver in the last few years that Shanahan and Lynch have drafted that has blown up in the system and produced at a very high volume in his rookie year should be on track for a huge 2021. And if not a huge 2021, you can expect a monstrous 2022. And the reason why you might take a step back in 2021, Kittle coming back healthy the whole way, hopefully. Debo Samuel more involved in the offense. So there's a chance you see a little bit of dip in production in terms of yards per game and touchdowns and things of that nature for IU in 2021. But his overall impact is going to be huge, and I'm here to show you why. We'll start off with this beautiful clip. Everyone should know this. The first touchdown of this young man's career, and it was an absolute glorious one. As on the little screen pass, it ended up actually being a rush attempt and not a pass. That beautiful hurdle at the very end of the play. Absolutely gorgeous. You'll love to see that kind of thing. And this, this play demonstrates his versatility as a, as a receiver. His ability to be able to, again, read blocks. You have uh, McGlinchey there and Brunskill out in space doing great blocks. But the end of the play, the athleticism there for, for this young man is absolutely incredible. It shows how diverse he is that Shanahan is able to scheme something up like this for him and that he is able to execute, navigate his way through traffic. And then the athleticism at the end of the play, you don't see that type of athleticism every day. That is very unique. It is very special. Uh, it demonstrates just how talented he is and what his max potential could be as an athlete, which is absolutely incredible. And let's just, oh, it's glorious. Look at it. It's just what a great finish to that play overall in general. Uh, Ayuk has a knack for his, his vision on the field is incredible. Uh, his ability to read things going on around him and diagnose is for a rookie, uh, bar none, extremely, extremely advanced for a guy his age. And this actually is going to lead into the next clip that we have of Brandon Ayuk, which is going to demonstrate that level of patience and his ability to read defenses and see the field. So the next clip, like I said, demonstrates patience. And it's in a game this season against the New England Patriots of all teams. Okay, it's a nice little rub route action here. He's going to run a little wheel. He's in the slot on the right-hand side. Hesitates off the line. Forces the, the two corners out there in space to choose. Once they choose, they both choose incorrectly. Both guys go, go to cover the little hitch route. He able, he's able to wheel up off the sideline, and he's wide open in space. The only person there that can cover him is the safety in the middle of the field, and there's no way he's going to get there based on where Jimmy puts the ball. Uh, he does hesitate a little bit. That slowdown causes Jimmy to throw the ball a little bit closer to the sideline than you'd like, and that 
causes Brandon Ayuk to have to adjust late to the ball in the air, which is what carries his momentum out of bounds. Watching this film breakdown with Mr. Robertson, he pointed that out at the end. It's very accurate. It, very accurate indeed. But the thing that's most impressive for me, like I said before, is the patience that Ayuk demonstrates. And you can see we have the play on the right side as the play works in slow motion here. Play on the right side of the screen that demonstrates the wheel route. You can see the two corners are going to bite and break on the hesitation off the line. And that allows him to come free off that wheel route in space wide open. The patience there from a rookie to know that he needs to force and slow down and wait for the corners to demonstrate who is going to be the guy that's covering him in space. And once he recognizes the fact that both guys are biting on that hitch route to get out of his break quickly and create separation so that Jimmy has an area to throw to and Jimmy's not having to wait four seconds for him to get into his route is absolutely incredible. It demonstrates the level of patience and his ability to read and react instantaneously. You don't see that a lot with rookie wide receivers. This year, this 2019-2020 draft class was incredibly deep at the wide receiver position. Brandon Ayuk is a testament to that. He was a guy that wasn't on a lot of people's radar. A lot of people weren't sure when they drafted him. He was an absolute home run. Next clip is going to demonstrate his ability to run the deep route successfully with speed, athleticism, all the things you want to see in a young wide receiver. You want to be able to get over the top, uh, especially in this 49ers offense. is one of the things that has been lacking, but Brandon Ayuk doesn't lack this ability. It's against the Seahawks in Seattle, first game, first time that we played the Seahawks this year. He's running a deep post route over the middle. Uh, you, you see a lot of guys bailing out in the coverage. Might be a cover four look, or you might have something like a cover two on one side and a cover three on the other sort of thing where they're mismatching coverages. But Brennan Ayuk absolutely toasts DJ Reed here on this post route. The very top of the route, he gets him to open up his hips, making him think he's running vertical, sticks in and runs that inside route. If it's anyone other than Nick Mullins playing quarterback there, this is a touchdown. All you have to do is lead him open to the other half of the field. Even if you throw him flat and he has to break for the ball, the other safety breaks on Kendrick Bourne's little deep hitch route. Uh, it's a touchdown. It's an absolute touchdown. It's the only time I'll give him any credit whatsoever. Kendrick Bourne, great route there. Way to pull the safety over. Um, but you can see Ayuk's speed is an absolute threat here. He pushes up field almost head down, shoulders straight, making the, the safety, this corner here, this nickel corner think he is going deep. As soon as he opens up the hips, no hesitation, puts his outside foot in the ground and starts breaking towards the middle of the field. His ability to, to get upfield with vertical routes quickly is a threat, and that allows him to get these deep routes 10, 12, 15 yards downfield, getting these safeties to bite, these corners to bite and shift and make them think that he's running vertical to open up and try and run with him. And as soon as they do, he's able to capitalize and take advantage of it. If he wasn't able to run routes over the middle of the field and, and get push and push deep the way he does, this wouldn't work. This demonstrates his ability to not only run a variety of routes, but the threat that he is over the top. I look forward to seeing 2021 how much of a deep threat he is and how much we utilize him in that deep vertical game. But even if you don't, the guy can run any route in the route tree and he can get open anywhere on the field. And now for my favorite clip of Brandon Ayuk. Actually, technically second favorite, but the the little uh, hitch, the little fade route that he ran against the Cardinals at the end of the year for his big touchdown. Everyone's seen that clip on replay a thousand times. This is an underappreciated route because it's not for a TD. And it's a nice little click slant route against the Buffalo Bills. Okay, you can see the release off the line. He presses into Davius White on the outside shoulder, really trying to press him like he's trying to get a release. Then he breaks inside like he's trying to break a slant off and stops it on a hitch. That gets Tredavious White to sit down in space and almost kind of slow down like this guy's not going anywhere. He's staying right here. And once he turns around and sits down like he's on that hitch route, he gives a little outside step and then breaks across the middle on a slant once everything is cleared out. They had a flood action on the left side of the field that pulled some of the linebackers away to create that opening in space, and then we're able to put the ball to him right in the middle of the field, and he's able to get a first down. It's a huge route from Brandon Ayuk that demonstrates his not only his patience again that we talked about, but his creativity as a route runner. He's able to pull this off against a guy like Tredavious White, who is not a Joe Schmo corner in this league. He is one of the top corners and one of the better corners in the NFL. The fact that he's able to do this as a rookie on a big third down is crucial. It's huge. It shows his creativity. It shows his patience. It shows you just how much of an elite route runner this guy can be. He needs some time. He's still got some things he has to develop, but by no means is Brandon Ayuk a scrub. He is a bona fide route runner in this league, and he's going to be a problem for teams 
all the rest of his career. So that's Brandon Ayuk. You saw it here first. Great route runner. Patience for a rookie. Next level. What do you guys think? Of course, I think he's a bona fide stud. Yeah, he. you can't teach that. You can't yeah. teach what he's doing can't out there. You can't teach that. Um, yeah, I think Ayuk, you know, I think when he was drafted, I think a lot of people were shocked. More that they traded up to get him. Yes. But I think that the value that he showed this year, I mean, it's more than obvious that they made the right move. This guy can be big time. When they were first saying that he reminded Kyle Shanahan and Isaac Bruce, I'm like, that's heavy praise. Yeah. Um, when he was playing this year, he definitely has that elite level of talent. And as long as he can continue to develop and can stay healthy, because that was something that kind of nicked him a little bit this year. But if he can stay healthy, he can definitely be a big time player. I don't know if he's Isaac Bruce, but if he gets anywhere close to that, I'll be happy. That's true. And it's another guy, like a couple guys we mentioned yesterday, a Juco guy. Yep. So he doesn't come with a ton of high level experience. He only played at ASU for two years. Now we had a fantastic coach in Herm Edwards. But he's a guy that's, this is more like the bottom of where he's going to be. And his ceiling's up here. So I'm very excited about Ayuk. Now, gentlemen, we have a guy that's going to cause a lot of, st- a lot of, a lot of issues. People are saying, let him go. It's time to part ways, free up the money. We've been bringing up, and you've brought it up multiple times, and on the podcast, that the money that you save this year for cutting D Ford really isn't that much, and you'd rather have a guy like D Ford. So can you back it up? Yeah, basically it comes down to whether he's healthy enough to play. And if he's healthy enough to play, is he worth the $20 million plus that he's going to make? If you cut him, you save $6.4 million. I'm saying that if he's healthy, you want him to play, but I'm not just going to say it. I'm going to show you why, because I think when he's on the field, he makes the 49ers pass rush elite. Yes, Nick Bosa makes it good and really good, but this guy makes it elite, and I'm going to show you why with these clips. We're going to start against Tampa Bay. You're going to see him. He's getting after Jameis, forces the pick. We all remember this is the first win of 2019, and you just see the impact that D Ford can make. He causes the quarterback to want to rush it because, look, he's drifting. Even he got the get off is so crazy. When we go to this again, watch how fast D Ford gets off the ball. He's up the field and around the tackle before he even has a chance. Nice shoulder dip, nice rip through, really making it hard for the right tackle to make a play. This is just fantastic defense. The get off is top level NFL talent. It doesn't get much better than that. You see how much farther up the field he is than Bosa, and he actually drives him into Bosa. This is fantastic. D Ford is an elite pass rusher, and this is D Ford healthy. If you get this D Ford, he's worth every single penny of $20 million, maybe even more. The 49ers need this because if they do, they'll go from being a top 10 defense to the number one defense again in the NFL. So you see what D Ford can do and what he can bring to the team, and I'm going to show you another clip, and it's going to prove that what he does is also force one on ones across the board, which means everyone can get through. His elite speed is going to be on display on this clip right here. So you're seeing D Ford, he's closest to us. He's going to get off the ball, throws the rip up. You see the arm go all the way up, hand go up as far as the um, ear, and he gets that full extension. That is just textbook defensive uh, in rush. The way he bent the corner right there and got his, dipped his shoulder, got his arm up with the rip move. But that get off is next level. There is not very many people in the NFL that can do this. Maybe a couple. And this guy is elite. And when he's playing, you see all the other guys have one-on-ones. And that's the matchup problem that it is for everyone else, is just the collapse of the defense coming right in on the quarterback, making him get out. But D Ford also is able to get the scrambling quarterbacks, which is something that was vastly missing this year. The 49ers were not able to, you know, corral these running quarterbacks, especially Kyler Murray. A healthy D Ford could help with that. Of course, Nick Bosa as well. But that's why this guy is worth $20 million. So Nick Bosa and D Ford, and when they line them up on the same side, can cause all kinds of problems. And this is kind of the, something that we were hoping to see this year and we missed from both of them. But we're going to show you the impact that D Ford can have working with Nick Bosa and why he makes Nick Bosa a better player. So anyone that's ready to move from D Ford, you got to realize it's going to take a little bit of the game away from uh, Nick Bosa, especially on passing downs. So watch this clip against the Browns. D Ford is lined up outside up on the top of the screen. Nick Bosa goes out and uh, occupies the guard and tackle. D Ford loops in underneath. 
It's a it's a tackle in stunt. It's a TE stunt, and he gets inside and he's going to make the play. Um, Nick Bosa actually gets the sack, but D Ford actually forced Baker Mayfield to move outside. You can see it really from this clip right behind Baker Mayfield's back. You can see what Baker's looking at. Nick Bosa comes up. He's going to occupy the guard. That's why he engages the guard. The tackle is going upfield in the kick slide, waiting for um, D Ford. And then it's too late. Bosa goes into the tackle. Tackle can't create. Guard falls down. Here comes uh, D Ford. And we got uh-oh for Baker Mayfield. He's saying a bunch of curse words in his head because he knows he's in trouble. And then Nick Bosa goes ahead and grabs his leg. D Ford comes in for the cleanup. This is perfect on pass downs. Being able to put these two guys on one side, just two elite pass rushers, it's almost unstoppable. It puts those guard and tackle in a bad situation. The fact that they didn't um, put a running back over there to help chip or a center to flow out is just amazing. They should have slid coverage that way. That's a Baker Mayfield problem. And the 49ers took full advantage of what they saw. Fantastic um, defensive line play and a great stunt. So the quarterbacks that gave the 49ers the most problems uh, were Kyler Murray, Russell Wilson, those guys, because they could extend plays, move the pocket. And it was so evident this year, and we brought it up on multiple podcasts, if the 49ers had speed at the defensive end, position what it would do. This next clip is going to show you exactly what we're talking about. We got Kyler Murray against uh, the 49ers in D4. And he's just on the top of the screen. He's going to rush coming off the edge. And he once again just de an annihilates the tackle. I was stuttering because it's so impressive to watch. He just gets up there so fast. This tackle has no chance. It's third and eight. When you get these situations and you can just pin your ear back and go, look at D Ford and Nick Bosa. These are two elite guys. The, the pressure they're putting on Kyler Murray, he just put his back foot into the ground for his final steps on his drop. And they're already collapsing on him. And then he takes an in, the upfield rush that makes Kyler Murray not be able to do anything while Nick Bosa goes to the outside. This is great defensive line play, and that means it's been coached really good by Chris Kacarek. But this is fantastic the way he bent the corner. When we're saying bend the corner, you don't want to let the tackle push you too far upfield. You want to be nice and tight so that way the quarterback uh, has to step up into the pocket where you have the big defensive tackles pressing the interior of the pocket back. So this is really nice. The angle that he takes... He doesn't go way too far behind Kyler Murray. He wants to get right to his back arm and attack there. It's fantastic. Make him step up or get to the sack. He gets the sack. This is a great play by D Ford. It's the reason that we have to sign this guy because with him and Nick Bosa, I'm not sign him, keep him. Because with him and Nick Bosa together, the 49ers defensive line is elite no matter who's in the interior. And we have big time guys inside with Armstead and Kenlaw. So they need to make sure they keep this guy. And these are the reasons why. Speed, speed, acceleration, get off, hand placement, rip move. The way he plays technically is fantastic. He's one of the best in the league. As long as he's healthy, you have to keep him. He's worth $20 million, no problem, especially for an edge rusher in the NFL. I think that is actually not high end for what he could be making on the open market as a healthy guy. I know we all love to play Madden and mess with the salary cap in our heads and people like to oh D Ford only had six sacks or seven whatever his number was it wasn't a ridiculous high number in 2019 and now he's he's been hurt and we can do without him yeah I'm sure we can if we have to but you would rather have D Ford on the field losing D Ford once again this all is about if he's going to be healthy for the season Losing D Ford is not worth six million dollars, because that's the way you have to look at it. Is that we're cutting D Ford over six million dollars, not over twenty million dollars, because we only get six million back. Correct. The fact we're still paying him fourteen either way. So if he's ready to go, they need to keep him because D Ford is a talent-wise, he's a generational type talent. He's never quite hit his peak because of injuries throughout his career. But um, when he's played more than 12 games or so, he's been a huge impact player on the, both the Chiefs and the 49ers. So I don't, if he's good and ready to go, I want to keep D Ford. I want him back because their whole defense is predicated on the front four getting to the quarterback. Yeah, and, and Ant said it speed, speed. You said it twice. I did. Because it's that important. 
Now, it's that important for this defense, and it's it's evident how much faster than he is than Bosa. And Bosa, I, I think everyone top to bottom would agree, is a, a key piece to this defense. And when he's not on the field, it shows. When D Ford's not on the field, it shows. I, so watching back some of these clips, man, the, how quick he gets off the ball is insane. It is crazy. He's sometimes two or three steps ahead of Bosa off the get, off the jump. So D Ford, 100%. You're not going to find a D Ford for $6 million. No. You're not going to find it. It's not there. It doesn't exist. And I, as far as I know, there isn't anybody in the draft that I've seen so far that's going to be what D Ford is right now. So $6 million is, is great, and it's nice for purposes of flexibility of the cap and getting some other pieces. But if D Ford can prove he's healthy, meaning you put him through the tests, you run through his physicals, doctors are clearing him, he's shown nothing but I'm ready to go, can go, and can stay healthy, all through, I mean, coming up and leading up to training camp, you keep him around, you eat that $6 because that $6 million gets you something that you can't find on the open market, something that you're not going to find this year, something that might not be available for a few years down the road. That $6 million is nice, but if you ain't use it, if you're not using it to improve this team, then that $6 million is better spent keeping D Ford happy, keeping him on this roster, and keeping the pass rush elite. One final stat on D Ford, and then, Horse, you can um, say is last year in 2019 when uh, D Ford was on the field, the 49ers pass defense was top three. When he when he wasn't on the field, they fell all the way to 19th. Oh. So just that impact that he made made the pass defense so much better. So remember that when we're talking also about getting rid of D Ford. That's true. And um, a pet peeve of mine got brought up here, and it's not that you guys said it, but it's I when people say, oh, we'll cut him and draft a guy. Okay, so we're going to cut a guy that's proven that when he's healthy is a dominant NFL player. Okay, well you can argue with me about dominant, but he is a very far above average NFL defensive end to draft a guy. So what people need to realize in that situation, even if you're talking with your first round pick draft a guy, for every Nick Bosa, for every D Ford, for every Miles um, Garrett, there is a Dion Jordan there is a Courtney Brown if you remember him from the Browns mm -hmm. for every one of those guys that's turned into a stud there's a guy that didn't do anything mm -hmm. Vernon Golston there's another one so there's no guarantee that because you pick a guy top 10 that that guy's going to be a successful NFL player so, and to leave your defense or a position group riding on a draft pick Yep. It's a dangerous proposition when your Super Bowl window's open. Correct. And and that's why, you know, that there were a lot of people last year with the Buckner stuff that were, you know, rightfully concerned. Those concerns have been answered. Javon Kinlaw is by no means a scrub. By no means can he not play. But he's not him yet. He's not there. He's not him yet, but we all knew that. You knew, you knew the sacrifice that you were going to make. You were going to try and replace a Buckner with two or three guys. Yeah, that situation in. was a little different. I think had you told John Lynch... Hey, Nick Bosa, D. Ford, and Solomon Thomas aren't going to play more than three games combined this year. Keep them. We'd have probably kept the fourth. Found a way to keep. The I, I think. Spot I don't think they would have. And the only reason I don't think they would have is because they couldn't get enough for Eric Armstead in trade. That's true. Also true. I mean, if they could have got more for Armstead, we probably would have signed Buck and traded Armstead. But it didn't happen that way. So, it it's kind of one of those things. But Buck, it was definitely missed. I think. Correct. He, he, he was. But again, the, the idea was the sacrifice you're going to make was right. some short-term production, try and replace that with two or three guys rotating in throughout the yeah. season. Uh, didn't pan out that way, but it is what it is. You can't replace D4 with one guy. It's not going to happen. You're, not, you're probably not going to reproduce or recreate his production with two guys. It's just not there. But a guy who stood out this year mm -hmm. and well, kind of kind of surprised some people and surprised one, one gentleman over here who's a big fan of the linemen is one Kevin Givens. Horse, what do you got for us on this? Um, Kevin Givens is a undrafted free agent. 2019, he made the practice squad out of camp. He impressed a lot of eyes, and, and he opened a lot of eyes, turned some heads in camp, making plays. He got on the practice squad. He actually was active throughout from December 28th on through the playoffs and Super Bowl. I don't think he... He might have got in at the end of the first couple playoff games when they were up by a lot, but he didn't play any significant time last year. Um, once again, came into camp this year, really had a nice camp. 
I hate to use the term, but got a little lucky with some injuries in front of him and did what you have to do when that happens and made the most of it and made their active roster. More guys got hurt and he really showed he can play. Um, he's he's undrafted because he's only about six foot six one, 280, 285 pounds. He was a first team all big 10 guy with 10 and a half tackles for loss and five sacks. So his numbers and all that look of a guy that would have been picked between like the second and fourth round. Unfortunately, teams decided he was too small and his jump, his vert, his 40, all that stuff didn't measure up for being undersized. But um, I think he started to prove people wrong. On the first play here, it's against the Eagles. This is right around when we first started getting playing time. Well, that's him making the tackle. When we catch it here to slow mo, we'll be able to point it out better. So if you stop it for a second. He's lined up right there over um, number 69, the right guard. He's at defensive tackle. It's called a three technique, which is outside of his shoulder. He comes off the ball here, uses his arms and low pad level, stop it again. Gets his arms inside on the offensive lineman's chest plate. Notice how low he fired off. He's getting his arms extended, but he also doesn't give up ground and make a lane for the running back to cut through as you see the linebacker coming through to fill. Now, that running back, Miles Sanders, is forced to bounce it to his right, and Givens does a great job shedding the block, getting the arms off him, and making the tackle for loss here in the backfield. This was one of the first couple games he really started to get to play in, and that was a big play that he made. See right there again, extension, off, tackle, which is textbook how you coach that position. Okay, this next play is a great play. If you've ever coached defensive line, this is something that you always want to teach your guys to do. And it's a hard thing to do. And he does it great right here. If we roll it, he's playing left defensive tackle. You see him get through and make the play. But if we go to the slower motion, you'll see him right there. He's at left defensive tackle. He rips by. He sees the puller. He sees the pulling, guys. So he stops, uses his eyes, and turns his direction towards the ball. And that's something you always teach people when you're teaching them to play defensive line. Here it is in slow-mo. Uses a nice rip move to get by the down block. Sees the pulling guard, knows the ball is going that way. Gets down there and makes the tackle. Also excellent play by Quan Alexander, like Anthony said, fighting off the puller to keep him from being able to go around. But that is fantastic. That's both athletically and using his football intelligence. That's a great play. Um, another thing that's nice to get out of your interior, guys, is a nice pass rush. Um, right here, he shows his ability to get off the ball quick, use a move. He's right there around the left guard. Boom, this is the last play of the game against the Patriots. Um, Givens is playing with high effort still. On the last play of a blowout, he's right there on the right side, outside of the guard. Hits him with a swim move before the guard knows what's coming. Boom. Around. Stidham didn't have a chance. I'm sure Stidham appreciated the guard for this. So right there, slow. Boom. Gets his hand on him. Swim. Right by him. Stidham doesn't see him coming. Doesn't have a chance. He'll be thanking. I'm sure he thanked 64 for that after the game. But right there, uh, given showed explosiveness, good hand technique, and just playing hard at all times. Which, I mean, he was an undrafted guy. He's got to make plays. And I think that's a big thing right there. He's still playing hard in a moment that doesn't really matter. He's going to have no outcome on the game. So one of the things about Givens that was negative is he's undersized. So that means he might struggle in the run game, especially against double teams. Well, right here in this play is an example of him using his explosion and strength and ability to keep his pad level low and use good technique to rip through a double team and make a tackle. The Rams center and right guard right here are going to try and double team. In this run play, you see him rip right through, fire out low. Boom, running back doesn't even have a chance. He wouldn't have made it anyways because Armstead blew his guy up too. Here's a better view of it. He stays low. Gets skinny, gets that rip through, boom. That's textbook the way you coach this position. Right there, low, gets turned, gets his hands through, keeps fighting, right into the running back, didn't even have a chance. 
right there that is textbook defensive line how to beat the double team um right here is a, another play that shows uh it's high effort he's quick he's explosive and once again able to stay low and use good technique to defeat a blocker um right here he does what's the anthony what's the professional term for it we called it a long stick when i was playing Don't know. he comes across the center's or the guard's face right here he's at the on the left side boom right by him makes the play josh allen's wondering who was supposed to block that guy <laughs> and right here you'll see it in slow motion right there low good pad level that guard didn't have a chance the running backs screaming ah! when he sees him <laughs> another fantastic play tackle for loss and if you watch josh allen's face after helmet turn after he makes the play he's got the what he's tackled already so that was another fantastic play showing off his explosiveness good technique and high effort i <laughs> think givens kevin givens is another great example of the 49ers front office's ability to find late round to undrafted guys with talent get them to their coaching staff now he had to sit a year on the practice squad and develop with uh chris kasarek and another example of Kaserik's fantastic coaching ability because he looks like he's going to be a player in this league if you watch those clips. He um, played in 14 games this year, up from like one last year. So, And he had, I think, five tackles for loss and a sack, which in his minimal playing time is pretty good numbers. Cool. So he's a guy that I think makes it okay for a guy like DJ Jones to leave in free agency or maybe even Solomon Thomas, you know, he's a guy that I think can step up and play significant minutes for the 49ers defensive line next year and be a good player. Yeah, yeah I think so. I think that uh, Kevin Givens is a heck of a player. I think that he could possibly make it so, you know, Armstead and them get less reps, which I think is important. We need the interior lineman, Ken Law, and those guys to get less reps. He'll fill in nice for deep... Uh, Sorry for uh, uh, DJ Jones. Uh, yeah, too many Ds on this team. It's a lot of Ds. Uh, but, yeah, I think that he'll fill in nice there. And then Contavious Street will also help. But Kevin Givens, it shows that the 49ers defensive line coach can develop talent. Uh, once again, Jones, this guy, um, they're just developing him nonstop. Maybe Darion Daniels down the line. So continual, uh, you know, Continual depth being created by getting undrafted free agents and players that nobody really talks about and then develop them, developing them into um, rotational pieces that can really complement the defensive line and all the top level talent that they have is something that's awesome to see. Yeah, and the big thing that if 49ers fans need to keep this in perspective as well, that is what's going to allow us to have and free up more cap space is the continual ability to locate guys who are undrafted that are not going to eat up a whole lot of salary that you can develop into role players or starters um, because at some point those guys in particular those undrafted guys when it comes time for them to get paid most likely they're going to try and go get paid and so you're going to have to be able to part ways and let those guys walk and let them let them blossom somewhere else or go somewhere else and falter in another system because they don't have the same level of coaching that they need to be successful that's going to happen a lot with this staff the way it's created the way the the system is structured if you've got guys like Kacerik who are solely focused on being a line coach and wanting to develop those guys and focus all of their attention and effort onto that, then you're going to have a lot of turnover with names and faces that you may like that may become fan favorites down the line. Kevin Gibbons has the opportunity to do that. He's not going to be an every down player. He's not going to be an every down guy. He's not even going to be a starter most likely next year, but he is a guy that's going to play a good amount of snaps that can eat into more snaps and take some reps away from Kinlaw and Armstead to so keep them fresh for the downs that you really, really need them and late in games when you really, really need their presence and their skill set to, to blossom and shine. Uh, Kevin Gibbons can help with that. And and the clips he brought to the table, Horse, um, opened my eyes. That, that guy looks good. A couple, a really good example of him, although I think he might even be a little better than, or have a little more talent than this guy, is Sheldon Day. Sheldon Day was was he undrafted or late? He was late round, right? Mm -hmm. Late round undrafted guy. Played with Kasarik for a couple of years. Had a role on that Super Bowl defensive line. Got broken off this offseason by the Colts. I think he paid him like two, three million dollars a year. It's one point 
One seven. I know we went over it. We're gonna do this again. It was one point zero seven five million dollars. Something. Well, compared to his salary on the Niners, that's getting broken off. It is. So, um, (laughs) but he became a billionaire. But he became a sought after guy. Right. He did. After being just a rotation piece for the Niners. Now it kind of went with you with the faltering thing when he got to his new place. But that is no fault of the Niners. No. But uh, I think it, that's a pretty good example of the kind of thing that situation Givens might find himself in. Correct. So learn, Kevin Givens. Well, stay here. You're going to get paid. And take less money. We like that. I would like if you can take less money. We don't have to worry about paying guys down he the line. He already gets paid less, less money. That's, that's also true. <laughs> I had a, no, no disrespect to any of those guys. Yeah. When it's time to go get paid, go get paid. Yeah. Go take care of yourself. Especially, fo- understand. Get paid. Especially exactly. football. Yes, big time. Because you your know, career can end on one play. Any sure. given moment. Any given Sunday. Any given play. Yeah. Punny. It was. <laughs> it was. So, player grade time, gentlemen. Time to grade these dudes out. Starting with Brandon Ayuk at the very tip top. We'll start with you, Ant. Brandon Ayuk grade for 2020. I'm going to give Brandon Ayuk a B+. Plus. And the reason I'm going to give him a B plus is because he wasn't healthy throughout, you know, throughout the entire season. He had a setback in training camp, and then kind of just, you know, with the COVID list and stuff, he kind of just didn't play as many games. I like what he did when he was out there, but you can definitely tell he's still learning to translate to the NFL game. But the talent is there. I think he'll eventually be one of the top, you know, receivers in the league. And the compliment of Debo Samuel and George Kittle to him, we're going to take him to new heights. But he had, you know, all the ability in the world. He definitely deserved the first round pick. And I think the 49ers hit gold with this guy. Uh, I, I think that's a solid grade B plus. I like that. Um, he had definitely had his A moments. But he also had his moments out there where you could tell he was a rookie. And there were the injury issues. And I think he got the Ronies once or twice. Um, Not good. So he... He missed some games. I think he would have been very close to a thousand yard receiver had he played every game. But I hit potential A plus. This year B plus. I'm gonna go actually surprise everybody. I'm gonna give him a B. And the reason I'm gonna give him a B is because we've seen guys in this offense who are ready to be elite guys succeed with guys like Nick Mullins. The year that uh, the year that Kittle was healthy, with Mullins playing quarterback for majority of the year. He put up statistically one of the greatest seasons the tight ends ever produced. So Kyle Shanahan knows how to get guys open and have them produce at massive levels. Ayuk produced very, very well given the games that he played, but the health was a question. The decision-making off the field potentially a question with the Roni cases. Uh, And he does have some things in some areas that he needs to improve. He did have a few drops. Uh, He struggled a little bit with some of the intermediate routes. But when he's dialed in, some of the catches he makes over the middle of the field are absolutely insane. As Horst said, potential is an A++++. I think the sky is the limit for this guy. His ceiling is a long ways up. It's going to take him a long time to reach that ceiling. But he doesn't have to reach it fully right away in the next few years to be one of the best receivers in the game. And I think it's coming for him. Brandon Ayuk is an absolute monster. He also strikes you as a guy that might need to hit the weight room a little bit. Just a smidge. Just a smidge. Yeah. I mean, he'll probably put on a little bit, you know, once he gets into more of an NFL offseason. This will be his first NFL offseason. Yeah, absolutely. So it'll be. It's a lot of rookies. Yeah, but I mean, that's, he has that's, a lot not, of that's not to say that you're not in shape or, you know. And he actually he's runs in great shape. He's in great for how shape. small he is, he runs hard. It's true. Yeah. It he's, he's very physical. He plays bigger than he is. Yeah. Now, with my guy, I don't think there's going to be very many grades on this. I think I'm going to throw the all incomplete. Yeah, um, because he just didn't play any snaps. So I'm definitely going incomplete uh, on this because there's just no way to, you know, grade it. I know it was an injury that he's had before. So I'm going to say incomplete. Yeah. Um, if you want me to grade 19, I'd give him an A minus. But. Huh. Um, for this year, it has to be incomplete. You didn't play. Yeah, it's it's incomplete. It's one of those you, you wish you wish there was some body of work that you could look at. The 2019 stuff, yeah, it's it's in the A category, somewhere in the A range. Uh, the the only real question with D Ford is, is there is there a way for the Niners? Is there a way for them to evaluate him and ensure that he's going to be healthy for 2021 for a majority of games? I think, like Horst said, if he's playing 10 to 12 games, there's no way you let him go. You have to keep him around. Um, especially if you can play 10 or 12 games and then be healthy for playoffs. 
I, I hope they can figure that, that that answer out because he's worth the extra six million. I think the fact that he didn't have surgery might be a good sign. Mm -hmm. Back if, surgery is bad. If we hear he has surgery, then he's probably done. Yep. But, so the last guy would be my guy, Kevin Givens. Um, I'm kind of curious. To, I want to hear what you guys would give him before I. So um, let's go with uh, Anthony. Hmm. We'll just go. The other I'm, way. I'm gonna give I'm gonna give Kevin Givens a B minus. I think that he played well um, in his snaps. Uh, I can't give him, you know, an A because he didn't leap off the page consistently and, every, mm -hmm. you know, when he was in there. But he did make plays, and I think those sporadic plays are going to turn more consistent. And once that does, then his playing time will become more consistent, and then he'll produce more and more. And um, I think he has the talent to be somebody that the 49ers can depend on in the future, but we just haven't seen all of it yet. But in glimpses, he had glimpses uh, this year that jumped off the page just like Javon Kinlaw, so that's a good sign for the 49ers. And the glimpses, if, if you just grade him based on the glimpses and don't look at anything else, for me, he's easily in the B category. But because there's other things, it's a C plus for me. He's uh, above, he's right on that threshold of being an above average player. The snaps were, the snaps that he got on the field, he does do a lot with those snaps. He does do a lot of good things. But it did take him a while to get to that point where he was getting more consistent looks on the field. He still had some things he needs to work on. He still does have things that he needs to work on as a player. Um, you, you know, he shows glimpses of the pad level, staying low, beating the double team. Those are one, again, you see one clip, that's one instance. There's probably plenty of times on film where he's not getting beating those as consistently. But he has shown the ability to do that so he can continue to develop and continue down that path. He's a guy that's going to be not only fighting for extra snaps and extra rotations, He'll be trying to claw and fight his way up into that starting lineup. C plus for me, big surprise uh, uh, for me on the season with that D line core. Did not see him coming at all. Glad that he did. Uh, I have him right there in the same range as you guys. I think, I mean, he didn't play a whole lot enough to get a high B year or anything like that. And yeah, he still had his moments where he struggled with double teams because he's a little bit light in the light in the old pants. He's a, you know, two hundred eighty five pound. <laughs> Defensive tackle is pretty small these days, um, so, um, but he... It's a good 30 pounds under what I was at my peak. <laughs> I mean, you see Javon Kinlaw, who's 320, yeah, um, and Vince Wolfork, who is 325, and, you know, you see a lot of nose guards, 320 to 340 defensive linemen, so... He's got to really make sure he works on that strength and explosion in the offseason and technique. Aaron Donald has proven you don't need to be big to be a dominant defensive tackle, but he's definitely got to work on having perfect technique every play. And, but, and bench pressing 500 pounds. Yeah, that, that does help. That helps. Yeah, that helps. also. <laughs> So those are the grades. Let us know what you think in the comment section down below. Do you agree with our grades? You like the grades we handed out? Were we too nice? Should we have been a little harder on these guys? Let us know. Let's have a conversation. Let's figure this out. And don't forget to like and subscribe to the page while you're there because we got tons of great content coming up. Yeah, there's going to be content coming out all through the offseason. You're not going to want to miss a single thing that happens because there's not just going to be episodes, but there's going to be all kinds of specials. And it's going to be exciting. It's going to be our first full off season uh, doing this, mm -hmm. so it's gonna be fun. Make sure you tune in every Tuesday and Friday at 5.30 Pacific. Now, the, the thing you need to make sure is that you click the notification bell, because if you don't click that notification bell, you won't know when all the special episodes go up, because they might go up at different times, not on Tuesday and Friday. You don't wanna be late. You don't wanna miss it, so make sure you're always tuning into the channel and paying attention, because we're gonna have a lot of great content. We want you to be involved in all the conversation. Write us some stuff. We wanna hear what you have to say. That's what's great about right now, the stuff we're doing, is not everyone's going to agree. Yep. So it's it's up for debate as long as it's all in fun and being a Niners fan. We're, all, we're up for debate with you guys to talk with you guys about it. You might see things differently than we do, and that's great. And also, like he said, that's why we make our show specifically at 530 so you guys know when to watch them. We, we want you to know when to watch them. I don't know if we specifically make them at 530. But at the end of the at the end of the day, it's the thing here. This, this is an icebreaker. We just want to have a conversation with you. Yep. We want to hear from you. We're fans just like you are. Yeah, we have a podcast. Yeah, we talk about it. That's because we want to. We enjoy doing this. The three of us have known each other for a long time. We enjoy putting it out. We enjoy having the conversation with you. So come on, let's participate. Let's do this. Have a lot of fun. Yeah, believe it or not, if we weren't doing a podcast, this is what we do when we're around <laughs> each other is sit around and talk football. So it's we true. just love doing it. Accurate.
it's very accurate. And you know what, you know what, guys, you know what time it is. Let's chalk another one up. It's not. It's not specifically five thirty. I can yeah. tell you that. Even in slow motion, he looks fast. Yeah. Look how much further up the field he is, dude. Yeah. He's got a good three to four yards on everybody. <laughs>